Some people don't want us to influence our young people. They said, well, let them make their own minds up. <clears throat> the only problem with that is that everybody else is trying to influence them. So it's not a matter of influencing, it's who is influencing. And uh, we, we basically have to stand your ground and say, whether or not they follow, but we will do what the Lord says. Mm -hmm. Joshua once said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's more challenging today to say that uh, with the state that your home is in today. It's more challenging to say that, but the word of God is still true. Praise the Lord. This morning, I'm going to share with you on a topic that I call lost and found. Well, that's a strange topic for Father's Day, but when I read the scripture, you will know exactly what it means, because it's exactly what it is. And it's going to be based from Luke 15, 11 to 32. And you know that as the story of the prodigal son. That's why lost and found is appropriate for that. Amen. So I want to read those verses from the uh, NLT, the New Living Translation, Luke 15, 11 to 32. And it says, to illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the same time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants had food enough to spare. And here I am, dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please, make me, please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But his father said to his servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. And kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now is found. So the party began. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. And he asked one of the servants, what was going on? Your brother is back, he was told. And your father has killed a fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him. But he replied, all these years I have slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me. And all this time you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. His father said to him, Look, dear son, 
you have always stayed by me. And everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead and has been back to life. He was lost, but now he's found. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your grace this morning. Thank you, Lord, that you are so, such a loving God, oh God. The depths of your love is unfathomable, Lord. We can't measure it. God, and sometimes, Lord, we can't understand your compassion, Lord, because it goes beyond anything we can do, Lord. But we, we are so grateful that you are who you are, for without that, Lord, none of us would have a chance. It's because of your love and your patience and your long-suffering, because of your heart while we are here this morning. And I pray, God, that you would speak into our spirit, Lord, that we may understand your heart, O oh God, for your children. And that somehow, Lord, we may get, Lord, that same kind of heart for our brothers in the Lord. Father, help us. Guide us this morning and anoint us by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Today's Father's Day. For some, it brings back happy memories. For some, it brings back sad, angry, or otherwise negative emotions. But like anything else, that doesn't always turn out as it should. We must not throw out the baby with the bath water. There's a lot of things in the world that don't turn out the way it should. Everything God created is good. But we live in a broken world, a fallen world, and all the people since Adam are broken and fallen. That is the basis from which we operate. We operate from a fallen, broken world. Humanity is broken. We are broken. And I don't mean broken from the point of repentance. The world is broken from the point of view that we have been messed up by sin. Sin is to blame. We often see the people, not the sin. And we don't realize that there's something behind Sometimes we hear people say the question, why would he do that? How can you do that? There is a man that used to be on TV years ago. Name was Flip Wilson. All the ones of you remember him. He was a comedian. And everything that happened, he said, the devil made me do it. And it was a big laugh. But when you look at it, that's where it's coming from. The tempter, the deceiver, the accuser of the brethren. He has one task, and that is to destroy us, God's people. God is the originator of, of the family. Mothers and fathers are his idea. In this broken, fallen world, even nature groans waiting for the restoration of all things to God's intended perfect state. We yearn for better because God puts eternity in our hearts. The reason we think things are not good when they should be is because there is a standard by which we measure things. And that standard is God. And so when it's not going well, we said, it's not good. It's not the way it should be. That's because God has put that ideal in our heart because he's holy, he's perfect, and we were created in his image. So we yearn. We yearn for better. We yearn that things would turn out the best for our children, for everything around us. We always yearn for the best. We have this desire in our heart because God has put eternity in in our heart. The scripture actually says that God has put eternity in our heart, but man has sought out all kinds of inventions. 
but he put it there. That's why we yearn. That's why we reach for the skies. That's why we endeavor to do better. That's why we are disappointed when people don't do as we expect them to do and as they should do. And the reason is because we are sinners in a broken world. It's Father's Day this morning, and, um, and I want to say, uh, as, I, as I said earlier on, it, it's a day of happiness for some, and good memories, and some for sadness. And that's why I made a statement that we still don't throw the baby with the bathwater. And I want to say today, in bad a state as Father would his, and I, I'm living in this world too like everybody else, and we know what's going on around us. But as bad as it is, I want to let us know that God is the one who ordained fatherhood. Yes. And I want to let us understand this. That in the same way, Satan has been trying to destroy God and everything that he's done. And us, everything that God has put in this world, Satan has tried to destroy it. And one thing we must not forget is that we should not join Satan in what he's doing. And what really happens, even in the church now, fatherhood is being made a joke. It's failed like everything else. But God still has it there for a purpose. I know the culture that we live in has made fatherhood look like a joke. And they pick the worst. And they use it to exemplify what fathers are and what men are in general. And I, I, I hope you understand me this morning. I know the problems we are facing. This is a broken world. That is the context in which we live. The men are broken. The women are broken. The children are broken because humanity is broken. And because of that, we all fail. There are some people who are really trying, you know. I just heard yesterday that a young man used to come to this church years ago, and I think he had two or three boys, if I remember. He doesn't live in the city anymore. And I, ju I just got away. I wasn't part of the conversation. I just heard it. And he said, you know, I'm trying to do my best as a father, and I just get knocked down everywhere I go. You get knocked down in the streets, knocked down in the radio, knocked down in the television, and then in the church. We don't forget the wrongs that have been done, but there are some who are Asking God to help them to do the best they can. And there are some who have done a great job. In spite of the failures. Because, you know, even when we are successful, we do so from brokenness. It's all because of Jesus. All because of Jesus. I am what I am, Paul says. Because of Jesus. And rather than joining the world in just destroying and cutting to pieces, let's pray, at least for the ones that are trying, encourage them. I look in our congregation this morning and it hurts my heart to see so few men in general and fathers in particular. There was a, a statistics that I, I referenced a long time ago, but I heard it. I don't know how old I was, but I stuck it in my head. And it goes like this. He said, if the children, if a child from the home is the first one to come to know Jesus, because, you know, you send your kids to Sunday school, and they hear, and the child may get saved, and then eventually a mother or father may come. They said, if the child is the first one that hear the gospel, 
14% of the time, the whole family gets saved. 14%. If it's the wife or the mother who first heard and come to the Lord, 52% of the time, the whole family gets saved. But if it's the man who heard and come to the Lord, 92% of the time, the whole family gets saved. Do you not know that Satan knows that? I know what some of the world's going to say. You're just a man. And you're just defending man. And you see how wicked man is. You know what? People can say what they want to say. Because if Jesus was walking the earth, they would have criticized him too. Right now. They would have. Jesus actually said, a strong man will not come into your house and destroy it unless he bounds the, the, the defender, the strong man, the husband in the house. If a thief wants to come to your house, he'll scout it out first and he will see who he's around. And if the house's strong man is not there, he knows he has a better chance. But Satan has walked into the home from the Garden of Eden and he has hit the home hard and continues this day to hammer the home. And if you see where homes are going now, where family is going now, it's under severe attack. And don't forget, there's a phrase that says, as go the family, so goes the church. And as go the family, so goes the nation. The whole thing is built on that unit that God has established. And Satan has gone right to the heart of the matter. And is doing his diabolical damage. And it takes courage. It takes courage from God to stand firm. And don't run. And to fight and to defend your family. Lord help us. We are living in dangerous and serious times, folks. Jesus actually said, when the Son of Man returns, shall he find faith on the earth. Faith in believing what he has given us. The recognition of a designated Father's Day was not started by a man or a father. It was started by a daughter to honor her father who had raised her and her four other siblings after the death of his wife or their mother who died giving birth to her youngest sibling. And she decided she wanted to honor her father for the work he was doing, for the work he has done. And then it was given, she raised it, and it was given official status by the help of some ministers, church ministers, and the politicians in the early 1900s. That's how Father, um, Father's Day came about. It was by a daughter who recognized what her dad had done. So you, I said, the successes, there are successes even in the face of the failures that we are. We are. Now to give you context of the topic lost and found. In the whole chapter of Luke, there, um, the whole thing, the whole chapter is about lost and found. The Pharisees and scribes were criticizing Jesus for receiving and even eating with tax, tax collectors and sinners. Luke 15, you can read the whole story. These religious leaders consider themselves to be righteous while looking down their noses on others as being lost. In response to them, Jesus told them three parables. Um, I'm going to emphasize the, the third one, but I'll just paraphrase the, the other two. The first one was in verse 3 to 7. It is called the lost sheep. And in the lost sheep, you know, Jesus was such a master teacher. 
They're, they're looking at him and said, you know, you're hanging out with sinners and tax collectors. They're like saying to him, to Jesus, we don't hang out with those people, you know. They're below our social status. They're not in our league. And you are a rabbi, and look what you're doing, hanging out with them, with the poor, with the sinners. So Jesus responded, and he said, there was a man who had a hundred sheep, and one went missing. And he left the one hundred and went and found and searched for the last one. And when he found it, he had a feast because he said, I have found my sheep that was lost. And then he said, there was a woman who had 10 coins and one went missing and she took her lamp and she swept the house. And I, I just imagine, because they didn't have electricity back then, she didn't have 60 watt or 100 watt bulbs. You had candles. And I can imagine her sweeping every nook and cranny in the house until she found her lost coin. And when she found it, she told the neighbors, I found my coin. And she rejoiced about it. So those were the first two. And then he told the story or the parable of the third son. But the lost sheep... And the lost coin represent material possessions and the extraordinary efforts by their owners to find them. People lose their stuff and they will go to um, great measures to find it. They can also represent, the lost coin and the lost sheep can also represent all of humanity, including the self-righteous leaders who opposed Jesus and the tax collectors who came to hear him. All are lost. The scripture said, there is none righteous, not even one. That's Romans 3 and 10. The lost prodigal son, I'll summarize it, I read it through already. A man had two sons. The younger asked for his portion of the inheritance. According to the culture of the day, as laid out in the Old Testament, the firstborn son would receive two portions, and the younger son, one portion of the inheritance. But usually, it's after the death of the father. But this young man came, and he wanted his. The young man would not even wait for his father to die. He wanted it now. Sounds like entitlement. There's such an attitude of entitlement in our world today. He disregarded the well-established tradition that everybody understood. I, some of the stories that I heard around um, inheritance, it just, it just boggles your mind. I uh, actually heard one told where there was a man and he was sick. And he was just sick for a long time. And uh, one of his, one of his uh, child actually was so upset. And the response was, why doesn't he die? He's just wasting and using up our money. That's the attitude you have. We have heard of news items where children have literally murdered their parents for the, for the inheritance. There was one, I think it was back in the 90s, the Menendez brothers. You remember those two? Yeah. Two of the most notorious. And the story they told and the tears they shed about how their parents were murdered by strangers and they were believed their story was so well concocted that they were actually believed until they found out. I think they're still in prison. The father gave him his portion of inheritance. He left home, went to a far country, 
Spend it all on wild living. Easy come, easy go. And all the friends whom he had entertained disappeared. You know, you heard that all the time. When you, when you have money, you've got lots of friends. When you don't have anything, they're all gone. Because you can't entertain them anymore. You can't sponsor them anymore. So they don't want you. They just look for another fool that they can hitch their wagon to. Some people like to buy friends, and if they have money, they will. And when the money's done, those friends are gone. They, they are known as fair-weather friends. <laughs> they are there when the weather is good, and when it's not, they're gone. And so that's what this young man did. He begged for a job fee feeding pigs after his money was gone. To Jesus' audience, a Jewish boy or a Jewish young man working with pigs would have been despicable to hear. Because, you see, pigs are unclean, and uh, the Jew Jewish people avoided them. He became so hungry, even the pig's food looked good to him. It's a good picture of the depth to which sin has brought mankind from where God created him to be. Here's the words of this song. Sin will take you further than you want to go. Sin will leave you longer than you want to stay. Sin will cost you far more than you want to pay. But then again, the, the line I missed out there that says, it gradually, gradually take control of somebody's life. So this man, this young man, he had this desire, he wanted to be on his own. You want to get away from under the control of his parents or his dad. And so he decided he's going to take matters in his own hand. But he came to himself. From the bottom of the pit, the only place to look is up. And he thought of home. When I, when I read that, there's a song that says, Home is where the heart belongs. Isn't it something? How many times have you heard that? How a, a young person grows up, and I'm not in any way saying that in every case it's bad when a young person leaves home. I'm not saying it at all. Because we know the situations where some, some have actually escaped for their lives. So I, please understand that I'm not looking at everything and say it's all um, roses at home all the time. Because remember, it's broken too. See, so he um, decided this is not good, and he thought of home. And I started off by saying how many times a young person couldn't stand home anymore. I'm going, and after a while, home didn't look so bad after all. Because you see, the grass always looks greener on the other side. Until you cross the street and look back at your grass and saw that it wasn't so bad after all. He came to himself and he thought of home. The words of an old hymn, and you know that I like to um, reference songs. I've wandered far away from God. Now I'm coming home. The paths of sin too long have trod. Lord, I'm coming home. He rehearsed his repentant speech and headed for home. I've sinned against heaven and against you, Father. That's what he said. He said, when I go home, this is what I'm going to say. I am not worthy to be your son anymore. Just hire me as one of your servants. At least I think he has a sense of reasonableness. He probably said, you know, I, I, I burnt my portion of the, of the inheritance. I don't have any more to get because I asked for mine. He probably realized my brother, that's the, the two-thirds that's left is his. So at least when my, while my father's alive, he can hire me, and I'll be willing to work, I get, get wages, and at least I'll have food to eat because the servants were fed. So that was his, his mentality going home, which I said from where he was, that wasn't bad. Sometimes it seems we have to be stripped 
of what we have in order to appreciate what we had. You see, because while we are where we are sometimes, we cannot appreciate it. How many times have we heard that? Until it's not there anymore. There's a saying that says you never miss the water until the well runs dry. Here's the real heart of the story, the father's response. I've, I've heard this story over the years. Uh, you, you go from looking at the three parts to three parts of a story. You, you have the young man who demanded his part of the inheritance, and you looked at him, and we vilify him for being arrogant. And then we look at the, uh, the, 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 the older brother who stayed home. And sometimes we say, you know, well, you know, Fair enough, he has every right to be angry because this guy really did go and blow his part. That's from our human viewpoint. And then we look at the father, but as the years go by, I come to understand that this is the heart of the whole story, the heart of the father. His father saw him coming from a long way off. And I thought he must have been looking out for him all this time. It's almost like this father was just looking down the street, expecting that one day he was going to come back. And how many parents you have heard with that attitude? The the, the child have wandered far away from home. And they just hope that one day they will find their way back and they come back home. <clears throat> that is why no matter how much trouble or how awful a child behaves, they seem always to be, especially from the mother's side, there's some remnant of love that is always there. My goodness. But the father saw him looking for him He had compassion for his lost, hungry, defeated, and shameful son. Excuse me. The father ran to meet him. That's not the way it's supposed to work in our world. That boy is supposed to come back. And he's supposed to only come in the house if I invited him. And when he comes, he better get down. That's the way we think. He better get down on his knees and he better beg my forgiveness. And if he's lucky, (laughs) I'll let him in. But this father saw him. I wonder if we get that picture that God sees us. David said, even before the parts come together in my mother's womb, he saw me. He knew me. The father ran to meet him. He had compassion in him. And not only did he run to meet him, he threw his arms around him. Kissed him, because that's the the greetings of the day. And had him clothed with the best robe a ring on his finger, shoes on his feet. He restored him to a place of honor and then threw a big party to celebrate his son who was lost but has now been found and who was dead but has now begun to live. You see why the heart of the story is actually the the father's heart. And you have to think about how Jesus is infusing this into the hearts of those who have no heart at all for the poor and for the sinners. And they are the righteous. And when they criticize him for being among these people, he said, I'll tell you three stories. I hope they got it. I hope we get it. The parable of the prodigal is an illustration of the state of all of humanity. Lost. But it is also powerful 
it powerfully illustrates the heart and the love of God the Father for all of humanity. The scribes and Pharisees who criticized Jesus for associating with sinners were lost. And they were blinded by their own self-righteousness. Which Isaiah the prophet says are like filthy rags before God. So here they are. Criticizing Jesus for being with the poor. And Jesus looked at them and they were all dressed in rags. What, what a picture. You know sometimes we, we, we look at people. And we, we, we value them for what they look like, for where they are in life. And we look at others and say, he's not worth anything. Look at, look at how he's dressed. Look at where he lives. But then those who are well-to-do, we lift them up. James actually said, it's a sin when a poor man come against you, come amongst you, and you treat him poorly, and a rich man come against you, and you lift him up. And James said, does not the rich oppress you? You have sinned when you do that. But how many times does that happen in our world? And even among Christians. In fact, I'll just share this. Um, over the years, over the years, in our local church, from we were over in the West End to here. It's something that I always never leave my mind is when people come among us whom we may consider are not where we think they should be. How do we treat them? We should always be aware of that. We get some people who would wish that certain people just go to another church. So we, we don't have to deal with you. Because we know we are not going to deal right, or are not dealing right, so somebody else can deal with that. But I always thought, what if God sends that person there to see how we are going to treat them? We should always keep that in mind. How do we treat one another? For God is watching, you know. Scripture said we should always be hospitable. Hebrews said that because unawares we might entertain angels. Angels don't always appear with wings. Sometimes they appear in rags. It takes the love of God in us to treat each person as God would treat us. And that's what he's saying here. That's part of what he's saying to the scribes and Pharisees. That's how you treat one another. But that's not how my father. Here's how my father behaved. That even though that young man deserves to be ostracized and cast out. But look, he was restored. You know that's what God is trying to do with us. We were not made for hell. We were not made to die. But death comes and hell awaits. But God comes in the way to intercept us. To restore us to where he originally had us to be. That's why he gave his life. Because he's in the restoration business. We fell, we were lost without God. There's a song we sing when he reached down his hand for me. I was lost and undone without God and his son. But he reached down and one person said he reached way down. In fact, there's a scripture that says we reached down for people even scorning the garments stained with sin. Sometimes people in such a terrible state. It's almost like you reach for them and hold your nose. Because the state that they're in is so filthy. But he said, reach on anyway. You can't stand the smell. Close your nose. But reach out for them. 
That's the heart of the Father. That's something we have to overcome. Because, man, I'm telling you, some of us, we won't even give some people a time of day. Forgetting that we are all lost. We say this phrase over and over, but I don't know if we, if we really mean it. There but for the grace of God go I. The older son who had no compassion for his younger brother, he wouldn't even call him his brother. He said, as soon as this, your son. It's not even his brother anymore. You're talking about sibling rivalry? This was sibling hatred. He didn't care about his, his, bro, his younger brother. He could have died. For all I know, he got his portion. Don't even show your face you're on here anymore. <laughs> Although he hadn't left home and did, and did his duties, and, and this part we need to take note of, Although he hadn't left home and did his duties, he was actually out in the field working when the prodigal returned home. So this boy who went and blew his portion and then had the gall to come back home, and he's still working over here. And he came. He too was lost. The son that never left home, who did everything he was told to do, he too was lost. The father actually begged him to come in. Come in to celebrate. The, you might say the resurrection of, your, father, of your, your brother. And he wouldn't even come into the house. He refused. Hard heartedness will destroy us if we refuse the call of the father. You almost get the feeling that now, and you wouldn't, wouldn't be too far off, that the prodigal who wasted a third of his father's um, efforts was now in a better place than his brother. Because, you see, he came back with a repentant heart. The brother at home did not have a repentant heart. We can be around for years in the church, and many have boasted of how long I've been here, and you young um, striplings are not going to come and tell me what to do. Because we've been around for a long time. You know, I have to watch that because I've been around for a long time. <laughs> and that's the truth, folks. Because being around for a long time, you get the feeling, you know, of power. I know. I've seen it all. I've seen your type. I've seen you come, and I've seen you raise a fire, and then, poof, and I'm still here. <laughs> and I'm always a God help me that I never feel so arrogant and foolish. Because I'm going to tell you what, and I was just thinking the other day, if you want to count years, it means 54 years since I've given my heart to the Lord. But I'm going to tell you this. The person who received Christ right now is just as saved as I am. Amen. And we need to know that. We need to know that. Where rewards are concerned, that's in God's hand for the service that we, that we, we performed. But you're just as saved. 54 years ago, the blood never lost its power. And 54 years since, the blood has never lost its power. And it will never lose its power. It will save the same as it ever has. 
saved. And that's what we should always remember. Remember that his hand reached down for us. And Jesus actually went on to say in, in Matthew 16, 15, he said, But if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. I, I put that in there because this brother at home, the good one who was always there doing everything, did not have a forgiving heart. And the scripture says, unless you forgive, you cannot be forgiven. And, and I thought about that one and said, my goodness, isn't, but isn't God powerful? Can't he overrule ever, anything? And I'll still give you, forgive you anyway, because he's God. While you still hold on to your unforgiveness. And I thought to myself, you know, it's like uh, if I want to give you something and your, 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 your hand is closed, I can't give it to you. Because your hand is closed. Because you've got something in there you won't refuse to let go. So you can't receive what I'm giving to you. But if you open your hand, you can let go what you are holding on to. And now you can receive what I'm giving to you. A heart that is closed cannot receive God's forgiveness. And that's where this, this, this son that stayed home was. His heart was hardened, unforgiving. No compassion at all for his brother. And even when his father, whom he claimed he had been obeying, begged him to come in, he refused. But he was always obeying. But when the father said, son, your brother was dead. And notice the father still said, your brother. Sometimes you have to remind people, it's your brother, you know. It must have pained the father's heart when his young son asked for his portion of the inheritance and left home. Knowing fully well that the end result would, what the end result would be, but he did not force him to stay. My. They say, you know, if you have a bird in your hand, if you hold the bird too tightly, you'll kill it. If you hold it loosely, you may fly away. And sometimes you have to let the bird fly. Because if you don't, you might kill it. But I tell you what, the bird may find its way home. Because you didn't kill it. It's a lie. Sometimes we have to let our children go. And you know something? Why do we want to hold on to our children? In the first place, we love them. And I, I made a confession to you that sometimes as parents, you're just scared to death that they're going to destroy themselves. And you want to hold on to them because you want to preserve them. And you want to keep them. You want to protect them. And they are, you know, shaking themselves because they want to get loose. And sometimes we hold on and hold on too tight and we lose them. It's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to do. But the father, when the son came to him, said, I want my stuff. He could have said, I'm not dead yet. At least let me die first. But he gave it to him. Didn't. And when he came to himself, he said, I'm going home. I'm going home. I, I love that thought that I can go home. I, I really do love that thought. And I want to say to us as parents, when your children leave home and you weren't happy with it, leave the door open. If they come back and the door is closed, they'll turn away and you may never see them again. Amen. 
Uh, it's not easy to be parents, you know. I wish your kids would know that. But I have a hunch one day they're going to. One day they're going to. Yeah, one day they're going to say, oh, this is what my miserable mom and dad were meant. This is what they meant. They really didn't need to kill me and ruin my life. Because that's what some kids said. My parents are trying to ruin my life. And, and I find a funny thing. When I talk to people from, you know, coming to Canada, you meet people from all around the world, different culture, and I find the same thing. It must be a parent thing. You know, home is where the heart belongs. God help us. If there's a home, at least, at least I can go home and see if my parents will take me back because nobody wants me. I've been used up. Everybody gets what they want out of me. And when I have nothing more to give, they throw me out. I wonder if those people who were always telling me how they cared for me, I wonder if they're still there. And I wonder if they will accept me. There's one thing about being a parent. <laughs> it goes around and it comes around. So it must have pained the father's heart when the son asked, but he let him go. God the father knew when Satan went to tempt Adam and Eve because he knows everything. But he didn't force them to obey his commands. You ever thought about that? Didn't God know what Satan was up to? And you said, God st stood by and let Adam and Eve be tempted by Satan. And he knew what Satan's intent, intentions were. I can't fathom God. But he did anyway. But here's what the scripture says. Peter said in 1 Peter 19 and 20, in context to what I'm saying here, that God knew what Adam and Eve were going to do. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot, he indeed was foreordained, speaking of Christ, foreordained, which means that it was already planned before the foundations of the world. Before God created the world, Jesus was already destined to come and die for us. For God knew what was going to happen. We can't make people serve God. We can't make people obey God. You can only speak and live and encourage. Because even God himself does not force anyone to serve him. It's whosoever will. I mean, Adam and Eve were given choice. People always say that, well, why, why, why did God give them choice? You, you try telling people that you have to do that. I say, you can't tell me what to do. Here you go. I've got my rights. You can't tell me what to do. You're not the boss of me, as the kids would say. <laughs> I do what I, this is my life. And I do what I want to do with it. One of the greatest things God has given us is free will. There'll be nobody in heaven kicking and screaming. Nobody will go there not wanting to do and God drag them anyway. It's not going to happen. The rich young man came to Jesus and said, what must I do to get into the kingdom of God? And Jesus said, you know the commandments? And the young man said, yeah, I kept them all. 
He didn't, because nobody has except Jesus. So he's almost like putting himself in a pen with Jesus. I wonder if Jesus is saying, oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> you kept them out. Even Moses broke him. All ten at one time. <laughs> You know, so so I, I thought Jesus, well, Jesus kind of played his game with him for a while and said, "Okay, one more thing: sell what you have, give to the poor, then come follow me." Scripture said he walked away, and Jesus was sad. Jesus loved him, but he let him walk. You ever notice that? He let him walk. Because he will not force. When the disciples gather around him and when he told them that this my body is bread indeed and my blood is drink indeed. And the scripture said from that time many did not follow him anymore. And he turned around to the twelve and he said, will you also go? It's like I almost heard Jesus asking them, are you guys going to stay? And one of them said, Lord, to whom? Even at that point, he never forced them. Still today, salvation is by grace, through faith, not by works. The older brother was going to work his way into heaven. And he found out it didn't work because he had an unforgiven heart. Heaven is a place of forgiven people. And you can't be forgiven unless you forgive. God is the father of all. Human fatherhood is, is in the state it is today because sin has separated us from a right relationship with our heavenly father. And as a result, we see all the broken homes and all its negative consequences today. So remember, I'm, I'm not trying to excuse those who abandon their responsibility as fathers. But I'm just giving a perspective that it is so because the world is broken. And until we come to Christ, it is never going to be fixed. In closing, hear the words of this very old song. When you're around for a long time, you know old songs. Okay. It, uh, it tries to capture the love of the Father and his effort to find and restore lost and the spiritual dead humanity. Here, I'll read it for you. He said, there were 90 and 9. How many know, remember that song? Amen. There were 90 and 9 that safely lay in the shelter of the fold. But one was out on the hills away, far off from the gates of gold. Away on the mountains, wild and bare, away from the tender shepherd's care. Verse 2 says, Lord, thou hast here thy 90 and 9. Are they not enough for thee? But the shepherd made answer, This of mine has wandered away from me. And although the road be rough and steep, I go to the desert to find my sheep. Verse 3, But none of the ransom ever knew that those of us who are saved. How deep were the waters crossed, nor how dark was the night that the Lord passed through here he found his sheep that was lost. Out in the desert he heard its cry, sick and helpless and ready to die. Verse 4, Lord, whence are those blood drops all the way? Those were not the blood drops of the sheep. That mark out the mountain track. They were shed for one who had gone astray. Here the shepherd could bring him back. Lord, whence are thy hands so rent and torn? They are pierced tonight by many a thorn. There's a question that was asked. I came home one day and my wife said she was watching something. And a man asked the two hosts on the TV, What's the only thing in heaven? That's made by man. And he said it, the people that were uh, hosting him could not answer. And I told my wife what she said. Oh, oh, you knew that? I said, yes. The only thing in heaven that's made by man are the scars and the hand of Jesus. 
So when this says, rinse all your hands so rent and torn, they are pierced tonight by many a thorns. And the last verse says, but all through the mountains thunder riven and up from the rocky steep, there arose a glad cry to the gates of heaven. Rejoice! I have found my sheep. And the angels echoed around the throne. Rejoice, for the Lord brings back his own. That's what Jesus came to do. And praise the Lord until we come to know him, until we uh, come into his fold, we will continue to be broken. But what a Savior. What a Savior. God bless you and happy Father's Day. Yeah.